Good morning. Today is Friday, April 28th. Thank you for joining us. We do have a packed uh, packed call today. We're going to review a little bit of the GDP report from yesterday as well. I know you talked about it yesterday, Tom, uh, probably. And, and uh, you know, I have not watched the footage from yesterday yet, but I, I will. But we will, we're going to go into a little bit more depth uh, today. Uh, but we're actually going to start uh, in Japan because we have some central banks uh, that are going to be meeting next week. We have the uh, Federal Reserve on Wednesday. We also have a very special guest today. Um, I don't know if anyone can, can see that, but we do have uh, Molly. Junior, 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 junior analyst, Molly Russell, sitting in on the call today. So uh, eating some applesauce. We'll see how it goes. We, uh, we tried to uh, sequester her over here with applesauce, but now it seems to have been quickly drained. So it's been devoured. Um, so uh, we do have the Bank of Japan actually meet last night, and they are going to keep yield curve control intact for now. That was a little bit more dovish than expected. They say that they are going to review policy, but they're not going to review it with the aim of normalizing. Uh, they could normalize, but basically they say the risk of tightening now is greater than the cost of moving a little bit slower, which is at odds with what the ECB is doing. It's odd, It's at odds with what the Federal Reserve is doing. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, they've sort of marched their own drum the entire time. And uh, man, this is not going as well as I hoped it would, with Molly. So bear with us here. Logan will have to wrangle her. Uh, yeah, but they've, they've always kind of done their own thing. They've instituted the yield curve control kind of on their own the whole time. And now they've made some slight changes, but they're not in a position really where they can be as aggressive as everyone else. Uh, she's now got two bottles, two airplane bottles of fireball that were left here as gifts. Uh, she seems very excited about it. So yeah, she's begging Japan. Here, I'm going to grab her. You, you jump in. I'm going to grab her. All right. Um, Amazon is also reporting uh, earnings, uh, reported earnings last night. Uh, the big the big piece was that revenue was better than expected, but still showed a decline on a year over year basis. Revenue was up 11% in constant currency. That was down from 12% last quarter. For Amazon to be growing just 11%, that's kind of negative. Um, online sales were up 3%, which was about in line with last quarter. But the big concern is that AWS, Amazon Web Services, which is responsible for a, the vast majority of uh, the company's operating income and cash flow, that saw a deceleration. This time last year was growing in the mid 30% range. Today it's growing at 16%. And then more concerningly on the conference call, management came out and said that in April, um, uh, it had de further decelerated 500 basis points to uh, an implicit 11% growth. So will that be sustained over the course of the quarter? If so, uh, that does bode fairly poorly for AWS going forward and also Amazon profitability. Uh, however, the profitability of the core business is improving. Uh, they've reduced employees by 10% on a year-over-year -year basis. So um, they're letting people go. And they are improving profitability, but the problem is the top line, especially on their most profitable business segment, AWS, is continuing to slow. Yeah. Do you think that this is going to maybe extinguish the calls for splitting it into two different companies, the e-commerce business and the, you know, basically the cloud hosting business, uh, just because it, they're almost, you know, incapable of being a part of this point, at least at the current growth rates? Yeah. I mean, I think that they, um, one needs the other. You know, AWS, uh, the 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 big e-commerce business helps to um, is really the growth engine, or supposed to be the growth engine. And then AWS is kind of the cash flow cash cow that funds a lot of these other projects. But uh, if AWS is slowing, you have a little bit of a ca less of a cash cow, but you still need it. Yeah. So I I don't think it'll um I don't I don't think that'll change. Now the question is. What are we doing in portfolios with Amazon? We do hold Amazon and we will continue to hold Amazon. I think that um, the issue for Amazon is that they are behind Microsoft in terms of actually growing their, their cloud business and reaching a bottom on that. The way the cloud works is that their customers, if you're a customer, you optimize your cloud spend. So uh, you and and you work with the cloud service provider to do that. So they're doing that. Microsoft was very early in doing that. 
Um, Google and Amazon were a little bit slower on that. So that's why Google and Amazon are continuing to see declines, whereas Microsoft has kind of hit that trough. Uh, Amazon is also losing a little bit of share at the margin of Microsoft. Um, having said all that, you look forward into the back half of the year and assuming the online commerce doesn't slow even further, I think that we're probably looking at a little bit of an improvement in Amazon in the back half of the year. You do have um, AWS that's going to have easier comparison periods, and you're also going to have a retail business that is looks like it's stabilizing out and becoming a lot more profitable. Um, they have cut a lot of costs there. Their headcount's down 10%. So I think on some of those aspects, Amazon is um, you know maybe only just a quarter or two away from really clearing some of this uh, debris that arose out of the pandemic. Yeah, I think all things being said, the fact that it's only down 1%, I think is a pretty good sign. I mean, typically I feel like if Amazon Web Services had had an issue in the past, it would have been potentially a double digit down day, whereas you know, the market is is understanding of the issue uh, and giving them a little bit of leeway in terms of price action today. And, and here's the thing, the stock was up, I think 10 or 11% after they reported earnings. Um, and then when they said they were comping down 500 basis points in April, that's when the stock erased all of those gains. And my view is we're only one quarter away from this not being an issue where they're comping down another 500 basis points in the following quarter. And so I think that the stock and the company is improving and wants to go up. Um, and if we avoid some of these issues with AWS deceleration, I think that it will. Yeah. Um, Switching gears to T-Mobile. T-Mobile is a sh company that we've been uh, actually adding quite aggressively to in portfolios. The company generates high levels of free cash flow. The company generates high levels of free cash flow and, and growing levels of free cash flow. And they can do it at a, a very attractive cost. They're growing uh, subscribers very nicely. The question is, why isn't the stock going up? Well, SoftBank has 48 million shares. Um, there's only 1.2 uh billion shares of t-mobile out there so you're talking about five percent and those trigger dilution at 150 dollars a share so, so the soft bank shares are just kind of sitting on top of the stock price um and if they can get a deal with that done and they're they are buying back a lot of stock if they can get a deal with that done i do think that the um t-mobile will move higher over time and they're generating so much free cash flow I think that this is the type of company that we really want to emphasize right now, companies that are generating cash and going to be returning it to shareholders, and they're doing it already in the form of share buybacks. I mean, especially when you compare their quarter to Verizon and AT&T, who both were just abysmal. Uh, you know, and so these are really the only three players in the game of any size, uh, and T-Mobile just seems to be executing on such a better level. Yep. Uh, even though, you know, we're not seeing the, the big upside that we probably should see. Intel expects a modest second half of the year recovery. Uh, they undershipped by about 20% in terms of uh, semiconductor chips in the first quarter. And so they think that inventory will uh, begin to kind of trough out here in the second quarter, which sets the stage for modest growth in the second half. Cloud and enterprise spending is very weak, but uh, that seems like it might be turning a corner here in Q2, Q3. And even PC spending is beginning to trough. And we heard some of that from Microsoft. If that is right, um, Intel does have a lot of operating leverage. It's a very, relatively cheap stock relative to where it's traded, but they still have a lot to fix internally. So we're not bulls on Intel. If you if you want Intel um, in your portfolio, take a look at um, Integris, which we do have. Um, they are an oligopoly provider, and they basically provide uh, um, consumable uh, chip equipment. So whenever you make a chip, you need uh, you need a slurry, you need to polish that chip. And that's what Integris provides. And um, so that that's one of the areas we play in. Uh, and we do also like analog devices, ADI. Um, they're seeing really good strength on the auto and industrial side. So uh, that's how we're looking at semiconductors. We do have some NVIDIA as well, although it's a fairly high valuation. Um, Intel, it, it needs to, one, write the macro ship, and two, fix uh fix their problems internally too yeah so i think it's interesting that it seems to be the way to play some of these more volatile industries right now is to be lower on the supply chain in the same way that we like chx in the oil space 
Molly really is excited about about this uh, conversation, but. Yeah, just being lower on the supply chain, rather be the pipeline, not what goes through the pipeline. And there's a little bit of value there. You know, you're a little less susceptible to the end product, in this case, semiconductors versus oil. This, uh, this call is devolving rapidly. I apologize to all of our all of our listeners here. Um, we uh, shifting gears to GDP. Um, personal consumption was 3.7%. I, so GDP number, I don't get, Tom. And maybe you can shed some light on this, but uh, if you look through the actual components of the GDP number, you had personal consumption that was up 3.7%, which was the best growth since second quarter of 2021. Uh, you had private investment that was down because of a big, big, big inventory reduction. Government spending was actually the fastest since the first quarter of 2020. I mean, that, that, that blows my mind. I just don't believe that. Um, and so if you look at it, uh, it was really goods spending that drove the economy in the first quarter. Uh, and a lot of that was driven by motor vehicle spending. So um, services was actually kind of in line. It grew about 2.3%, not, not great growth on the services side. Um, and a lot of that was due to healthcare. So I think my philosophy, my thinking is that uh, goods has been actually weak in first quarter. Services has been relatively strong um, but the goods was massively inflated in this GDP number relative to what I think the underlying is. And so I think that the GDP number was probably inflated by that as well. On the other side, you did have a big inventory draw, which which might offset that. Yeah, I thought it was interesting, too. We kind of went through the, the details on the fly yesterday on the call, but the, the standout that there was such a big move in, in vehicles that it somehow had goods being the driver it mm -hmm. did seem confusing and the, the numbers were not quite there. So. You know, I would say that we're probably, you know, where would you put real GDP closer to 50 basis points, maybe a full half percent lower? The the, the tricky thing is, I would say probably a half percent lower uh, than where, where we came out. Uh, because the other thing is you had inventories being a 226 basis point drag. Um, you had inventories being, you go. yeah, you had inventories being a 226 basis point drag. Uh, on GDP, um, and uh, you know that was that was the big driver of the decline in private investment. Um, overall, market view right now is that there are four types of companies reporting earnings. Number one, and we'll talk about this in the market memo today. Uh, some companies have made the cuts and have taken the medicine. I would put Microsoft, Meta, and Intel in that. Maybe even some trucking and semiconductor stocks. Um, other companies have a little bit more favorable operating backdrop, but. We don't really know exactly where they're they're going to land out, and that's airlines, things like General Motors, Deer, Caterpillar, uh, energy companies. Some are just operating dynamically, responding to the environment as they see it, which is like Amazon, Google, J.P. Morgan, for example. And then some are a bit lost, um, and these are the lost companies are often good companies but uh, kind of been deluded into thinking that they're such great companies that they don't really have to worry about the macro. And that includes UPS, that includes Thermo Fisher, and also includes a company called Enphase, which is a big supplier of microinverters for the solar industry. Um, and they've just been growing gangbusters and, and they are the leader in the space. They have excellent gross margins, they're rising gross margins, but uh, with interest rates where they are, people don't have the money to finance a solar roof. So um, they're a little bit lost. That's kind of the overall market backdrop, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the market memo. Please let us know if you have more questions on that. But next week, Tom, uh, big week from a uh, we kind of it's the passing of the baton. So whether this week was about 120 percent earnings capacity, like relative to our capacity, 120 percent uh, on the on the earnings side. Next week, it's going to you're going to start to see a handoff. Maybe we're going down to about 60 percent on the earnings side. But we're ramping up big time on the economy side. We have the Federal Reserve meeting with the ECB meeting with the jobs report. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be a really interesting Fed meeting. Uh, I think they're they're reaching the point where the market itself, I think, is going to start to really push back on the Fed, on the Fed raising rates. Uh, and any indicator, I think, that they're going to do more than one more rate hike, I think, is going to cause maximum volatility, both on bonds and stocks. Uh, you know, so we need to continue to be really cognizant of the potential downsides because, again, we I know we've said this a million times, but, you know, when the Fed raises interest rates, the downsides are skewed far more to one side than the other. And we need to be protecting 
you know, the we need to be looking at duration, we need to be looking at credit, we need to be really, really defensive here because it could get very out of whack very quickly. We've seen that happen three or four times now over the last year and a half. And we'll end it there. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday. Say bye-bye, Molly.